I want to follow on from some of the comments I made briefly this morning, and my purpose is to present what is pretentiously called a 4-2 sociology type thing. But what I want to do really is open the space within which we think about translator training, translator education, improving the way people translate. And I include interpreting within that term translation. I'm going to present an imaginary space, which has a line, which is an x-axis, as you know. And at one end of that line, we have situations where everyone translates. And I don't know what to call that, so I'm calling it omni for everyone, omni translation. Where could that be? I was at a conference in Melbourne some years ago, and an indigenous woman from the north, from Arnhem Land, was telling us that she learned her mother's language when she was a child. Then she learned her father's language. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Your mother and dad spoke different languages. Oh, yes. Then, she said, she learned her language at the age of 12, 13. Her language was her skin language or her totem language, the language of her identity. Every person learns three languages. If every person learns three languages, nobody needs a translator. This island, Waruri, in the north, north of Australia, studied by Ruth Singer at the University of Melbourne, has a community of 450 people in which five languages are spoken. Not varieties of languages, languages. And everybody speaks their own language, but they know how to understand at least two other languages. So you have a, a constant use of what's called intercomprehension or passive competence in the other language. Either nobody ever translates and no translators are ever needed, or everyone is always translating themselves or translating the other. But no professional translators are needed in such a community. They exist, ladies and gentlemen. They have English as well as one of their languages. At the other end of the continuum there, Let's imagine that there are places where only very specialized people translate. These would be societies where everyone learns one unified language as a question of identity and allegiance or loyalty. And the recruitment of translators is highly specialized. I don't know what to call that. If you're a good Latinist, I put arti because it concerns the artisanal, the special skills that are involved there. This would be the other end. And that could be found all over history. Uh, the earliest record we have of, of, of interpreters being used in southern Egypt, in, in, uh, uh, down to Sudan, are people recruited from the border regions because they have those languages because of contact. Uh, but the reference is to the overseers of dragomans, that is, the political control of these otherwise not entirely trustworthy intermediaries. Sparta in Herodotus, you can find accounts of the messenger class, which is hereditary position. Uh, a whole story is sparked by a Persian messenger being killed. You know the dictum is don't kill the messenger. Uh, you have this whole section in Herodotus about the Spartans' atonement for the killing of messengers. And it's very clear that in these society, Messengers are special people. It's a position earned by birth. It's passed on from father to son. You find the same thing in the Orando Tsuji in Japan from 1641, when uh, the uh, interpreters, translators, mediators in contact with the Dutch traders were this special hereditary class of people who lived on an island. So they were controlled. I just want to, ah, and then, of course, if you're in a situation of new contact where you don't have these border regions that haven't been established, you can grab hold of your natives, take them back to metropolis, and train them in the languages as Columbus and uh, 
uh, the conquistadores did in the Spanish experience in the Americas. So we have that axis, that axis, sorry. Our societies are not entirely at that end and not entirely at that end. We're somewhere in between. But we are at different positions in between. Some of our societies are incredibly multilingual and others are incredibly monolingual. And some have a unifying script to complicate the situation even further. I have a second axis to propose to you. That is between what I'm calling intensity. You have some translation situations where you have high intensity. And by that I mean frequency, that the contacts between the languages concerned are frequent. There is a frequent flow of information. And worthy or, uh, or receiving social investment. Social investment can be how much you pay the intermediaries, how much you put into training them, how much prestige that these, these intermediaries actually have. So I'm, uh, this is a composite variable. I'm putting many things together, but especially frequency and, and uh, writing on the top of that, uh, investment, effort, cost, if you like. Um, the intensity uh, also varies significantly according to the technologies available in history. The technologies regulate uh, both the frequency and the amount of investment required. Okay? Now, I'll just leave that as it is. Uh, each translation situation or each extended situation between a given language pair could find a position on these axes and they'll be very different positions, okay? What interests me, for example, is the relationship between language learning and the use of high-intensity mediation. Mediation I use for translation and interpreting together. If you're over here, where everybody's learning languages, you're not going to find anything around this part of the, the grid. If you get high-intensity, high-frequency contact between languages, hey, people will start to learn the languages, and you don't need professional mediators. Uh, this is a very simple logic. It comes from the costs involved. Here I'm trying to map. I did this years and years ago. Okay, just imagine that's time going this way. When you learn a language, it's a lot of work at the beginning, right? But you get better and better and better, it gets easier, and it tapers off. You don't get to full, complete native skills, if you like. But at around time t2, it's obviously much cheaper to have people learning the language than to employ translators. Because translation costs, uh, they go down a bit. You've got to establish the norms of your project, the rules, the glossaries, the translation memories, whatever else you want to build up. But then you've got to pay by the hour, by the word, by the page, and it doesn't go down over time. If you have a long-term relation between a language pair, high frequency, high intensity, it's logical you're going to learn languages and rely less on translators. If not, then not. You start to get a logic of where translators would be used and where other things would be used. And what I'm most interested in is this logic whereby language learning is part of the deal. If people are moving towards language learning, because they're up in that part of the graph, okay, whoops, up there, then what they do with translation is what they learn when they learn the languages. I'm very interested in how uh, translation has been used in language learning classes, has been excluded in recent decades by communicative approaches, immersion in the West. Uh, it seems, though, from a survey we did for the uh, European Commission that in Chinese language teaching, translation has maintained a place. But I'm very interested in the virtually um, overall impoverished notions of translation that are used in language learning, which is one reason why I don't want to exclude that part from my vision. 
as I mentioned this morning, it's great to train the top of the top, the creme de la creme of the profession. But don't forget that many other things are happening in many other parts of that graph. The other thing that interests me in relation to that vertical axis of intensity is the remarkably variable nature of the information flows. Here I'm just going to show you a few examples from historical research. You'll ask, what does this have to do with translator training? You'll see in a minute. These are translations from Korean into English over a long period of about 45 years. What I'm interested in is that it goes up and down. Of an almost fractile thing. I mean, it goes up and down on the big scale and up and down on the little scale, if you look at it closely. To be sure, there's a moment of intensity, there was information to be transferred, etc. But it goes up and down. This over here, this kind of contact, um, is almost static. It's the occasional translations that are done. To, just to make sure, are we still in contact? Can you hear me? Can we still translate between these languages? Very, very low intensity. The intensity moves up here, but even then, it's up and down, up and down. Look at this. This is, oh, that all came up altogether. These are translations into Portuguese, okay, over a long period. Uh, English, French, Spanish, Russian. I, the Russian is phatic. Are we in contact? Very little, you know, from time to time there are translations, low intensity. The, the dominant one, amazingly, is Spanish which would be surprising, and there are political reasons for that. But what interests me most is that all the graphs go up and down. There are no constant translation flows, except for the very low intensity ones. And some of the research, oh dear, that didn't work at all, did it? Hmm. There's some of the research I've done. This is uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. This is in the 12th century. 12th and 13th centuries. Translations from Arabic, this is of Arabic proto-science, going into Latin and then going into Romance languages. Up, down, up, down, a little bit there. Okay, there was something to get across, it got across and it comes down. Irregular. Another project I, was in, I carried out for a while, this is poetry. Over a century, 1840, 1940, between French and German, up and down, up and down. This extreme variability of translation flows means that the intensities are not constant. This is worrying. There are situations that have relative constants. For example, I've been talking with people who train translators at El Paso, in Mex on the Mexican border with the United States, where you have a, a huge bilingual population and lots of need for translation. You have language learning happening, but you have uh, a fairly constant call. A and you can theorize translation or train translators for a fairly stable market in that situation. But for much of the rest, the historical evidence is translators are called for when there is something to be transferred. And that when can be extremely irregular. Intensities cannot be assumed to be constant. This might explain why we found some of the things we found. In, 19, no, in 2012, we carried out a study for the European Commission on the translation profession in Europe. But we included other countries around the world, one of which was China. What did we find? that about 60% of, you know, just taking the available studies and taking the, the average, about 60% of translators work part-time. That is, they mix up written translation with interpreting, that's quite normal, editing, uh, writing, uh, especially teaching, that we have a remarkably part-time workforce. Didn't work well, did it? 74% work freelance, and the movement within companies in Europe has been to outsource translation departments outside of companies into smaller uh, freelance or 
uh, specialized language service providers which are more agile. And whether or not the percentage of women, which is around 70%, uh, influences that is a question of debate. What you find, and I think I've got it there, no I don't, is um, a fairly unregulated workforce able to respond with flexibility to movable demands. You do not find massive long-term stable employment. It exists in some situations. Canada, for example, because of its official bilingual policy and the capacity to pay for it, has a huge demand uh, for long-term stable positions in translation. Europe, because of its policy, can do it. But these are only a small percentage of the universal market. The labor force of translators and interpreters in the world is exactly 333,000 full-timers. That's the equivalent of. Give or take 100,000. I did the calculation. Okay. It's, it's not that big and it's not that small, but the percentage of full-time, long-term um, long stable employment is fairly neg negligible. Unless you're in one position on those graphs. The risk, ladies and gentlemen, is to assume that the ideal situation is a situation that applies across the board. The reality principle, though, is that translation is an unregulated profession. That is, anybody can call themselves a translator and or interpreter in any country in the world except Slovakia. Check the laws in Slovakia. And even there, they have devious ways of getting around the, 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 the regulations. What does this mean for the way in which we train translators? It means first we can't be idealistic. We can't assume an ideal situation and we cannot take in a, a situation that applies in one part of the world and apply it to another. The way you translate, translate, the way you train translators in each case depends. What does it depend on? Well, now I can say the distribution of languages, that is, who is learning what languages, and the availability of social investment in the frequency or prestige or money put into the people there. If you get those factors right, then you can set up your training for that particular situation in that particular country for that particular language pair. This means that what appear to be the best practices which work in one part of the world, in one particular situation on that imaginary space, cannot be transferred into other parts of that space, to other parts of the world and other situations. It's unrealistic to expect that to happen. It means also, you know, there's a lot of talk about, I don't know, Western ideas in translation theory and translation studies, and we need Eastern ideas or Asian ideas or non-Western ideas. It's not that. It's not a problem of, oh, it's all there and bad and over here. No, it's a matter of having to decide in each case where you are, where you want to get to, and what you have available. Then you look around and you borrow the ideas, the inspiration, the models, from wherever you can find them. But you have to start from that grounding of where you are on the grid. What are the languages what are the intensities? For example, you can pick up the European Masters in Translation Studies, which has a wonderful model of competencies that you need to train professional translators in Europe at master's level. And you can look at all those things and you say, well, yes, that's fine for you. There in that market with that amount of investment that you're going to put in for the training. But if we're talking about it on an international level, no thank you, I need only one or two. Or, for example, you can pick up that model, which is for training translators in the large national languages of Europe, which is what we've been doing, and say, oh heavens, we have thousands of 
asylum seekers on our borders. We have to get out there and see who they are and process them in some way. Oh, dear me, we don't speak their languages. What are you going to do? Sit down and wait for five years for this model to be applied to train people in these particular languages that are coming in? No, you have to think of something entirely different. You have to start picking up the people who have the available languages from the communities and giving them some short-term training to handle a very urgent problem. You're going to have to do a completely different kind of training. And you have to forget about this transfer of best practices. It won't be ideal, but the urgency, the intensity is certainly there. Another negative consequence that I'm drawing out a lot of photos. <laughs> okay, so just in that imaginary space, that's the first thing I want to get across. You have to think again in each particular situation, all right? The second one is when you have a lot of, of diverse things happening around and it's hard to control all of that, the risk is to solve it by, by moving up. If you're translators, you know about it, okay? Uh, you know how surgeons, surgeons have this thing, you know, if in doubt, cut it out. Uh, translators sort of work that way as well. Oh, I don't know what that is. Uh, cut it out or generalize. And you move up one level of, of, of abstraction. So you won't be right, but you won't be wholly wrong, okay? A lot of this happens in translator training. Uh, for example, we are getting an increasing number of master's programs that are functionally multilingual. That is, you've got lots of different languages coming in, you don't have the available staff to handle all those languages, and so you move to abstraction, and you offer a kind of training that is not language pair specific. I presented this somewhere else, but uh, some of you might have seen it before, and it's been messed up here anyway. Okay. I calculated, I, with Esther Torres and myself, uh, calculated the percentage of non-language pair specific contact hours in the master's programs in the European Masters in Translation. Okay, I note that, okay. In some countries, in France, it's about 80%. So if you go to France and you're going to study Chinese-French translation, you will get Chinese-French translation for 80% of the time, and then you get 20% of, I don't know what else, theory, ethics, translation tools, all that stuff. Okay? That's good. If you go to many of these other countries, though, it's under 20%. Under 20%. That is, one in five classes will concern your language pair. And you can say, oh, well, that's okay because translation skills are not language specific. We can give you a generic class. We can give you the theory class. We can teach you research methods. We can talk about ethics. We can do even more theory and more research. Under 20%. And you're coming out as someone who has a master's in translation and in many cases interpreting. This is interesting, okay? This is handling a situation of demand and supply in ways which I think are not doing credit to the profession and are not meeting with the approbation of the industry. I'll be even dirtier and present the statistics for the United Kingdom. Uh, you can't see the names of those universities and just as well, okay? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's the, the big ones are what's available and the little ones are what you can get away with, okay, what's obligatory. So if you're going to study in the United Kingdom and your English isn't too good and you want to pass your masters, you might want to do something down this end. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, we do have one case of a master's where no foreign language competence is required. A master's in translation. All right, Th that's perhaps anecdotal, but look, anything that is under 20%, something serious is happening. 
What's happening is that foreign students are paying a lot of money to be in an English-speaking country, and in, the, in passing, they're enrolled to learn a lot about translation theory and translation studies, and they've outsourced the actual language-specific work to tutors. Okay, it's handing a situation on the grid. It works for them, but that, I suggest, can't work across the board, perhaps won't work for countries where high-quality translation and interpreting services are required. Uh, the PowerPoints are all on my website. You don't have to take photos and things, okay? <laughs> it's all there. Thinking in terms of the grid, of opening that conceptual space, does, however, have some positive consequences. One of them I mentioned. It forces us to see language learning as part of the deal. You can't just think, oh, I'm going to train professional translators and interpreters. Why? Because many of them are not going to remain professional translators and interpreters for very long. Most of them will move in and out of translation and interpreting in the course of their careers. They will doing, be doing many other language activities. And one of the main ones they'll be engaged in is language teaching. And the second is... Whole societies are getting their knowledge of translation through language teaching. And I think it is urgent that translation scholars, such as this august, or soon to be august, institution, not forget about what's happening in the wider society and get out messages about what translation is, how technologies can assist in translation, how we can learn to use the technologies better, how we can teach translation better across the board. I'm not talking about everybody being trained to be a professional translator and interpreter. I'm talking about raising the skill level in your societies. Since many people are doing it, whether you like it or not, we might as well get them to do it better. Okay, that's the first thing. Relations with language learning. The second, follows on from that. Since it's happening everywhere, fan subbing, films, audio, all, all your Chinese students have learned great English by following American films and television series illegally on websites, right? And you've got this great fan subbing going. Really good, it's, you know, active, intelligent, subtitling communities doing really good things with translation without any training. Okay, and that happens in Chinese, but it happens in Turkish, it happens in Arabic, it happens a lot in Spanish. We've got to be in touch with these activities. We have to be aware that it's responding just a different place on the grid. You know, high intensity, high involvement with high language learning. People are engaged in subtitles as a way of engaging and learning language to a higher level. People are reading subtitles as a way of learning language as well. And these are activities that are not condoned by traditional translation studies or traditional modes of training. Think about where they are on the grid. Interact with it, study it, incorporate it into the classroom. Uh, a former doctoral student of mine, David Orrego, has used that. He has got students in our classroom to sign up into a fan-subbing community, to get feedback on their, on their subtitles from within that community, and they've since joined the, the community. Non-professional, they don't get paid, but they've learnt a lot. Okay, recognition of skills at different levels also concerns certification. There's something I mentioned this morning, and I think it's worth mentioning again now. At the moment in the world, we have some certificate, I mean, systems where people go and do an exam, they pass the exam, they get a bit of paper that says they can put some, num some letters after their names. Okay? This works in some parts of the world. The American Translators Association has an examination system. You go and get that bit of paper, you're an ATA certified translator, and it means that on the market you will get paid more money. That is, it's worth doing it, it's worth investing in it, it's worth training for it, because 
you get a financial return afterwards. The same can be said for NATI examinations in Australia, mainly because the Australian government is the main employer of translators in Australia and the Australian government set up the certification system, but anyway. Okay. Uh, and I think for the Chartered Institute of Linguists in the United Kingdom, although the exams are done outside the United Kingdom. These are models of certification systems that work differently in different contexts, but work to the extent that the product has a market value. People do it because it's in their interest to do it. Okay? They work, amazingly enough, because they're not related to training programs or only indirectly related to training programs. The three examples I've given have pass rates that on average are around 20% at best. You don't want a master's program where only 20% of the students pass. They will get discouraged and ask to have their money back, for example, or will not be enrolled. So we have a, a, a disjunction within this training community. We have training programs that have exams and give bits of paper, and then we have certification processes that happen afterwards. And putting the two together is going to be very difficult all over the world. Now, as I said this morning, I think the need for an international certification system is urgent because part of the sociology I mentioned there should include mobility. Translators and interpreters are people who can work in many different situations, in many different countries, and have their qualifications from different countries. We're people who get up and go to wherever the work is around. It's part of that instability. If the market's unstable, you go to where the work is. Look at conference interpreters and how much they have to travel. Or look at anybody translating online for clients in different parts of the world. We, we, we create stable employment through mobility. Unfortunately, the certification systems are not mobile. They are different in different parts of the world. And I think one of the things that has to be done somewhere in the world is to get an international certification system going. There are many ways of doing this. You could get the Chinese one and rewrite it for the whole world. That's one way of thinking. Or you could start from agreements between the ones that exist already in different parts of the world and see where they can agree on things and where they could come uh, to some point of common criteria on which they could recognize each other. Now, if you have, as you have in China and as they have in Australia, different levels of recognition, different skill levels, then you can get higher pass rates, which is socially more acceptable, and you could recognize the plurality of the social demand. That is, the people who are doing, who have, have not had any training, who know languages, who have experience and, and want something to attest to their experience, they can get one level of certification. And then the high-level people that you want carrying out your state business can have a higher level of certification. I think that is important. It's not being recognized in many of the models of translator training, although I can see from this morning's presentation it is being recognized in the Chinese proliferation of different levels and different training institutions. That was it. I've not quite finished, I will summarize. I think if you want to be a world association, you have to think truly globally. That is, from one extreme to the other, from everyone translates to just a few people and how it's been done through history, and then how much we want to invest or how little is being invested and where we can afford to be on this axis. I've proposed that in each country, each institution, you have to start from the ground to think of where you are and what you want to do there rather than transfer best practices from one side of the world to the other. And I've suggested some areas in which that globalized mode of sociological thought can require the assistance of a world association. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, Professor Pim, for uh, sharing your ideas with us on the sociology of translator training. Um, very, very informative, insightful, he goes another two adjectives, resourceful, and of course, most of all, sociological. This is about the soci sociology of uh, translator training. So thank you very much for sharing. I think this is very, it's very good, perfect timing. We have two minutes left. So Professor Pim, would you like to uh, take one or two questions to, you know, to use up the two minutes? Thank you. We have uh, just about two to three minutes for one or two questions. I, I think it's very interesting the idea that perhaps what, you, um, what we should be training for in different areas in response to, I was just wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit in particular about the EMT competences not necessarily being applicable. In, could you give me um, like an example of how you think they might not be applicable or which ones wouldn't or why it wouldn't? Yeah, look, the, the pressing example I've been working in Vienna, in addition to the other places mentioned there, and you've got the asylum seekers, refugees on the border. Uh, and the, the students in Vienna are really great, and they're all volunteering, they're going out there, they're dealing with them, they're doing what they can, but they don't have the languages because we haven't trained people in those languages. And what you've got to get are people who have the languages, and you give them the minimum. You can't go through the list of all these competencies. Oh, we're going to teach you, you know, translation tools now and relations with... No, they need ethics. It's the first thing they need, okay? And they need the terminology of, of the processing that is there. And you can do that in three days, so you do it. Okay, so that would be one example. But there are many other things in between, okay? The other is the training of... Oh, sorry, there's another question. There. Okay, one last question from there. Thank you. Uh, Professor Pim, I am Alexei Kotolaev, the head of the Moscow School of Audiovisual Translation. You mentioned fun subbing as a tool of uh, learning languages, and you also mentioned that currently the remarkable nature, the remarkably diverse nature of the sources of information. Do you think that audiovisual translation is, uh, well, translation of films, games, is a special discipline to be taught? I don't know. It took me many years to get to the stage where I can really say, I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, my son, who is 12, does all the technology stuff much better than me, uh, so the younger people might know. Okay. The real problem is, um, is deprofessionalization. I mean, so many people are doing the, the dubbing, uh, the, the, the subtitling for free, but then uh, game site localization is a huge industry, bigger than Hollywood. Uh, so there, there are good jobs to be found. Yeah. That's exactly what we are doing. We are teaching people how to do that. <laughs> okay, okay uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to thank Professor Pim again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we uh, give over to our preliminary speakers. Thank you.